Hey, this is Eric. Hey, what's going on, Eric? How you doing today, bud? Good. Is this Arrow? Yeah, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I you know, first of all, I uh, I appreciate um, the commitment to calling on time. That really helps out. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what, though, I, I'm one of those people that three hours early is six hours late. So I would have called you three hours ago. <laughs> and, and you're calling, are you calling from Charlotte? Yeah, yeah. You guys been here before? No, not not uh, not with the band or not even on business. But um, yeah, so cool. Wow, let's, um, how how do you like to run these things, the, the actual interviews? Bas basically what we do is we have a conversation. In other words, we, we talk about uh, romantic traffic and we talk about how the, how did this song even come into play? Because, I mean, what, what's really great about this song is that every instrument has a personality and, and that you don't hear that in a lot of songs. <laughs> wow. Hey, you know what? I'll take it. Um, this song came about um, primarily from our singer, Ryan Jones. Mm -hmm. He... Um, writes all of the song lyrics um, to any of the Corvus Lore songs. And yeah, so he, he brought this one to us um, a couple months before we were prepping to do the latest album, which is called Lucida. And um, as soon as I heard that opening riff, I, I knew right away um, that it was going to be a song that was going to have impact and definitely um, fit with the, the style of songs that we were trying to write, which... Um, you know, pays homage to the type of rock music that we listen to and absorb and follow. And, you know, you, you could think of uh, bands like Stone Temple Pilots yeah. or The Cult, um, even some, you know, harken back to, you know, Zeppelin. And, um, yeah, so from a music standpoint, you know, obviously that, that tune centers around that, you know, the guitar riffs. And... Um, and so when we got it into the studio, um, we worked, you know, with our producer, Tim Narducci, and uh, who is uh, not only just um, an excellent producer and knows how to, to uh, record and mix guitars, but he's also an excellent guitar player. So, um, yeah, and, and when, you know, when it came time to doing like layers and, and adding in ideas for the song structure, um, Tim was all in, in terms of like, you know, Hey, if you've got a melody guitar line or you've got, uh, you know, a second or a third guitar, you want to add on these choruses and we, we would just bounce back ideas. And yeah. that's, that's how we, we ended up with the song as it exists today. So then when, when you start layering the music and things like that, what do you do for the live performance? Because I mean, you can't go out there and, and unless you're going to bring in the, you know, the whole orchestra to, to layer it out there. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Well, um, so our our singer Ryan also plays rhythm guitar, so we do have um, the the approach of of you know there being like a foundational guitar at all times, mm -hmm. and then and then he and I will just you know split guitar duties. So on a song like Romantic Traffic, you know there's a few things happening in the chorus. So I really just I I look at it um, as a roadmap, and I say on the first chorus I want to hit these things, and on the second chorus I'm going to add in you know, the, this chord inversion and go up higher on the neck and just try to build some uh, interest or, or tension. And uh, yeah, so that that's, um, you know, primarily the song uh, from a musical standpoint. Um, the lyrics are also actually pretty interesting. I, mm -hmm. I can talk about that for a minute as well. Absolutely, because I mean, that, they, you know, first of all, we're in this age where people are, are writing music and they're sharing their stories, but what, what they're not hearing are the actual physic, you know, the, the physicality of how a song can come together. Because, you know, the one thing about hip hop is that you can just put anything on it, it's going to sell. But no, that's not, but real songwriting, like Romantic Traffic, this, this right here, it has to be crafted. It has to be textured in things. So I'm always anxious to find out how you guys brought it all together. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, the the again, our singer Ryan uh, is is the lyricist for the band, and w what I really appreciate about um, the way he will craft lyrics is that they're never on the nose. You, you'll never hear, you know, um, I love you, baby, but you know, you left me that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and but this particular song, um, it, it came from his uh his job outside of uh our band and having to do travel travel to the far east um having to go to you know places like taiwan and elsewhere and he would always hear from either family members or, or people close to him wow you get to you get to go to china you know that must be exciting and and so this this the song lyrics dance around the idea of how 
romanticized and people can yeah. view um, having to do travel, especially for work. But the reality is, is that it's, it's tough and it's tough on relationships and uh, the pressures, especially when you're traveling for work of having, you know, to, to, uh, you know, make good on either uh, projects or um, just even trying to stay in touch with people. And so, you know, the first lines out of the gate on that song are, you know, uh, lights flicker on the headlight, one ticket for the show. So Ryan's basically telling you like, you know, this, we're starting this thing here. Here's the start of the song. Um, and the next line is rolling, rolling Chinese jazz. And it's a silver screen alone. So, uh, in his, <laughs> in his time in, in China, you know, he, he's being, uh, you know, he's spending time with, with, uh, other coworkers, and vendors and like one of the things they did was they went out and listened to local music which one of it one of the venues happened to be uh doing chinese jazz and um so yeah that, that's he's, he's you know definitely weaving in some lines from his actual experiences there um and also just um you know putting his creative spin on it which i think is great I, I'm a daily writer, so I, I love wordplay. I love you know you know doing things with words that really you know isn't part of the norm. But but then when people look at you, and they kind of go, I I don't get it. It's like then I did it right because because you, this way you can at least think about what has been written. And and I call that hidden speak is what I do because if I just blatantly say it, ah, you know, that, then there's no fun in that conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. The website. Yeah, we we got to talk about that website. That that picture of the, of the band. That that that. How long did it take to get that perfect shot? Uh, you mean our, our promo picture? Yeah, yeah. That. Um, so we have worked with this photographer. Uh, her name is Jenny Cash, and she does um, photography for uh, BAM or Bay Area Music Magazine out in in San Francisco. Um, oddly enough, that particular picture was it was taken in sight of uh, a local um, small clothing store oh, that wow. happened to be uh, happened to be in, in her her uh, general vicinity we cleared out a corner and uh, era as you can probably imagine you know you've got to shoot two to three hundred to get like five great ones <laughs> that's what I'm saying that's a... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and of course, you know, it's like, you know, does this band member is like their head cocked and not wear? Does this guy have his eyes closed? Um, but yeah, that I think that one came out pretty well. I think it, it's it's a good representation of the band, and so we've been using it um, for a lot of promo, certainly with with uh, Valley of Fire Records, who is our record label. Speaking of that, Valley of Fire, I wish you probably are reading my notes somehow, some way, because I mean, boy, you guys are promoting Valley of Fire in a huge way, right there on the video, right there on, you know, on the website, everything like that. I, I usually don't see the actual, uh, you know, label or anything like that with, with most bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so Valley of Fire uh, is is a very small operation. At, at this time, it, it's two people, and uh, so one of which is is our record producer, Tim mm -hmm. Narducci. He, he, along with his partner, J.J. Garcia, um, set out to launch their own uh, independent record label in probably around January this year. So we we were the first ones to get on the ground level, and it was extremely special for us because number one, uh, they were believers in the types the type of music and the songs that we want to put forth to to our audience, and they also you know they they don't just do one style of rock music mm -hmm. like it's not just like core metal or doom rock or you know so their 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 focus is really finding bands that they believe in that they you know enjoy the songwriting and and want to promote um so that yeah we're definitely um 100 behind them um and yeah they, they've they've done other other help for us in terms of like you know trying to get the band in, in front of um other well-known artists, you know, trying to, to get onto um, other other bands, tours, and things like that. So, so far the relationship has been great, and uh, we couldn't be happier. Well, I, I love the idea that there is that collaboration between the the you know the record label and the band because I mean that you know what everybody they, they see what they want to see when when it comes to the promotions and stuff like that. But if I see that name, I'm going to go well, wait a second. Valley of Fire. These guys have got their stuff together. I'm going to have to listen to this band now. <laughs> there, you know what? You bring up a good point. There is kind of this um, 
uh, I, I don't know if it's uh, uh, transparent or apparent, um, you know, value in terms of bands having the support of a label versus trying to do everything 100% on their own. Mm -hmm. We we did do our first album self self uh, recorded, self promoted. You know, handled all the distribution, and um, while it you know is I guess somewhat of a plus because you can manage things on your own and, and you know you can see the reporting and exactly how how well your your music is translating to your audiences um there on the promotional side and on the connection side uh being a part of even just a small record label um to me far outweighs trying to do it all on your own mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the studio together as a band or are you guys in there dropping one track at a time this album uh we, we well the first album, we did everything direct to tape. So yeah. we were all just in a live room, uh, recorded it out in Oakland at a, at a place called Tiny Telephone. Mm -hmm. And so it was 100% analog, you know, very minimal overdubbing. Um, but but for this next album, Lucida, the one we did with Tim Narducci, um, definitely all in the same room for, you know, basic tracking, especially with drums and, mm -hmm. and bass guitar. And uh, yeah, and then after that, you know, did, did uh, guitar separately and then you know bass and and vocals last well there's there's nothing like the punch edit man I, I I've always thought of that we, okay this is what we're gonna do we uh, okay we need you to start right here and all of a sudden boom you're in and and you, you just keep going and, and the thing is that one thing that uh, there was a guy that told me one time he says man if you're punch editing your vocals what you're doing is you're teaching yourself how to quit I'm going oh well, what are you talking about I, <laughs> <laughs> well you know what actually I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I've also um, you know I'm a fan of of um, studio recording you know the, the discipline behind it the techniques that people use and I am definitely not a fan of, you know, someone that will just use Pro Tools and copy and paste yep. and stack, you know, guitar tracks and just try to create a brick wall of of, um, of guitar tones, you know, just trying to maximize uh, the decibels, right, and get the, that heaviest amount of compression. In fact, when we went with Tim, one of the first things he did, like, with the guitar tones, because Ryan and I both use um, amps made by a local builder in Santa Cruz nice. called Kevin Hallbrook. And they're, they're all kind of Marshall Plexi, you know, of the late 60s, early 70s era type tones. Tim right away would say, take your gain, you know, turn it on two instead of seven and let's get your volume maximized. And he really tried to get things to sound bigger by doing less, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody wants number 11, man. Number 11. You got to hit 11. So it's absolutely. Oh, my God. You know, and, and, and you know, and I think listeners are smarter than that. They just don't know that, you know, over compressed music really does. It crowds up their head. And especially when they're wearing earbuds and stuff like that, they need to they, they needed to, you know, find that definition. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was even trying to listen to. um Gosh, I think it was Ozzy Osbourne's uh, Patient Number 9. I think it was something, a, a tune or an album he just recently put out. And I, I, right away, you could just tell, man, does this sound uh, un unorganic, manufactured, uh, copy and pasted? Just it, 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 to me, it doesn't. It, I don't find that appealing in the least bit. Um, but that could be just my own personal taste. No, I, I totally get that because it's one of those things where you know, like you take a song like "Benny and the Jets" from uh, from Elton John, where he fabricated that that live audience. Man, that wasn't a good time because I was just getting into Kiss Alive, and I was getting into <laughs> Frampton Comes Alive, and then you give me a fake audience. What are you doing, dude? <laughs> you and me both, man. I guess you and I, you and I are probably a, of the same era. Yeah, I, w I was definitely listening to the the same type of of uh, you know kind of glam and and early stages of of rock and i definitely came up during the era of guitar heroes like yeah. you know eddie van halen and randy rhodes and just but as i you know got older i just that the idea of writing songs and writing songs that you know you'd want to listen to more than once to me became more of of a of a primary directive than than trying to be you know um speedy shreddy guitar type playing you know one of those songs that uh, i wanted to listen to more than once uh boxing ballerina uh, and, and it's because yeah. because I'm addicted to those damn fingers on that guitar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bo Bo Boxing Ballerina was our first uh, single. That song came about um, by I I was fiddling around with uh, open G guitar tuning, and and that opening riff came like I just tuned my guitar to G and and somewhat had the, that opening guitar riff, 
and uh, and then Ryan, you know, stole that away from me and, and wrote, <laughs> wrote wrote those verse and and a, and a catchy um, chorus to it. But um, yeah, when we sent this that track off to be mastered, um, the guy, our, a friend of uh, or an acquaintance of ours, Michael Nielsen, he runs a company called Ninja Tracks out in Los Angeles. He was he shares his office with with his partner, and he so he got the track from me. And he put it on, you know, his studio monitors and, and was turning it up to volume. And his his partner ran down the hallway and came in the room. He said, what the heck is that? And he goes, it, it sounds like a cross between, like, Stone Temple Pilots meets the Black Crows or, or something <laughs> along those lines. And he, he told me that, and I, I took it as a complete compliment, not not uh, derogatory in the least bit. But I'm glad you like it. I'm glad mm. you've listened to it. When are you going to put it on the road? Are you guys going to go out, or what, what what's happening here? We have um, we've done some some shows in Southern California and just completed our, uh, a show last weekend um, in more of the Northern California area. Um, and so the the shows we're, we're focused on now are, are more towards um, some of the bigger um, places or bigger theaters yep. and hope, hoping to get out of California, maybe in the Las Vegas area, maybe maybe up uh, north to um, to Oregon and Washington. But. Uh, that's that's being planned for 2023. Well, there seems to be a big rock movement happening in not only the California area, but also in, in the Chicago area. It just seems like those are the, the two generated places. And, and it's like the, the rest of the nation is catching up, but it just seems like nobody wants to take that big leap. But I will, though, compliment classic rock radio stations who are now starting to play newer rock instead of just playing Skinner all day. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. Um, the you would look to those um, those channels or those sources to to hopefully carry the torch forward for um, you know making lesser known bands uh, visible. Um, good music is good music, right? So right. Um, we hope that it translates to uh, places outside of our, our own uh, you know domain out out in the San Francisco Bay Area. So what's the website where people can come and find out more about the band and give you guys a lot of love? Because I'm sure you've got some merchandise with a name like yours. Holy crap! You better have merchandise. <laughs> yeah so the, the website is corvuslore.com um, and our, our social links are on there and uh yeah well shoot i'm glad you like the uh kind of the, the branding or the logo as well we, we uh develop that stuff all ourselves, and kind of comes from a, a tip of the cap to uh alfred hitchcock and edgar Allan poe and <laughs> and um <laughs> Yeah, so shoot, give me your address. I'll send you a shirt out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, the, you know. But but you know, go back to the name there for a second, and especially when it comes <laughs> to the logo and stuff. In reality, during your days of growing up through music and stuff like that, that logo plays a major important role in why you like a band. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it 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 does. And um, to be honest with you, when we were coming up with it, I had had outsourced it to um, to a, a company that that does some design and as they were passing over ver versions of the logo, it just, it wasn't quite landing with mm -hmm. how I kind of perceived the, the band persona and, and the type of music that we were writing. And I, I, I ran across um, just kind of a, a font, a style that I, I really, um, you know, resonated with what I, I think was a good representation and just came up with that one myself and, and uh, it's, it's worked. So I'm glad that you, find it to be uh good <laughs> isn't it kind of the pits in the creative mind though when you when you spend the money of, on somebody that's coming up with an idea and you end up coming up with it, it's like damn it damn it we could have had this for free god dang <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and, you know also good just to bounce ideas off of other people right because yeah. um we might um as i like to say or you know get high on our own supply or yep. you're drinking our own kool-aid and so it, um, as you start getting validation from other folks outside then you, you kind of know that you're doing something in the right direction. Absolutely. you got to come back to this show anytime in the future, Eric. I mean, my God, you guys have got a story that needs to be shared continuously. Oh, Eric, I, I really appreciate your time today, and I hope you have a good one. Same to you, man. You be brilliant today, okay? Okay, buddy. Take care.